Welcome to another podcast episode of DIY Guitar Making. I also produce video episodes of DIY Guitar Making live in the workshop. To find both the podcasts and the videos all in one place, go to DIYGuitarMaking.com. You can even subscribe to the email list there to receive new episodes, both the videos and the podcasts, directly in your inbox as they come out. Again, that's DIYGuitarMaking.com. And with that, let's get to the show. Hey guys, good morning, afternoon, or night, or whatever it is when you're listening to this. Welcome to another episode of DIY Guitar Making. Today we're going to be talking very specifically, zooming in on the topic of guitar makers clamps. This is sort of a continuation from the previous episode that I did, which was on buying equipment for guitar making. So that's like your stationary power tools. That's what I mean by equipment. If you haven't listened to that one, that's a good one to listen to um, even before you listen to this one. Not that you can't understand what I talk about here on its own. You could listen to this first. Um, Either way, I think at some point for a little bit of context, it would be good to jump back to that one. And that's because these episodes... The the ones that are coming out right now, I plan on doing several episodes back to back to back about tools. Originally, actually, I planned on doing uh, just one or two episodes on tools, and I realized the category was simply too large to cover good ground in just one or two episodes. So I kind of went nuts, and I decided to break this down into, I don't quite know yet, but I, I might go on for 10 episodes before I really feel like I've adequately, or at least somewhat adequately, covered the topic of tools. So, with that said, in the future, you can look forward to episodes on tools ranging from topics like measuring tools, hand saws, I think I'll do a whole episode on hand planes, an episode on card scrapers, files, razor knives and razor blades, dremels and routers can have their own episode, I'll do specialty guitar making tools, uh, specialty fretwork tools, and uh, handheld power tools. I don't know if I'm going to do all of those, um, but I'm looking off to the side here at a sort of spreadsheet that I've made of potential episodes that can come out of this one idea of just discussing tools. Now, I do realize that uh, some some of you are going to ask me, essentially for a list of tools. And actually, I do have something like that in my online course, which is a paid course. So I've already done this, and I've covered this topic pretty extensively in the online course, if you have that. And it's more visual, of course, obviously, than a podcast. So I do realize that there's a disadvantage to this medium, this audio medium here, that is definitely better served in video, but I also realize the strength of podcasts, which is that you can listen to this while you're driving in your car, you can do it while you're uh, working in your shop on your guitars, just have it playing in the background. I know a lot of you guys do that. So you're learning in a different mode, essentially. I like to think of it as you're, you're learning by osmosis. You're just kind of letting ideas trickle in here and there rather than really sitting down with either a book or even a video and uh, taking things, taking notes and, and doing things like that. I understand when you're listening to a podcast, you're probably not sitting there with a pen and paper and taking notes on the individual tools that I talk about. Um, and if you're driving, please don't try to do that. So anyway, these episodes I think are going to be monster episodes. They're going to be big. They're going to be packed with lots of information. And I think they're going to be the kind of episodes, like I said, where you can learn through osmosis by listening to them. And you can really just listen and listen to them again and again and learn something new about the topic every time. 
and a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about for tools will be for beginner builders that are just starting to tool up. But honestly, I think veteran builders will realize a lot of things that they didn't realize about the tools that they already own through listening to these episodes. Or they'll learn about tools that they were just unaware of. So there's something for everyone. And by the way, if you are subscribed to this podcast in whatever uh, platform you subscribe on, you may have noticed that I don't produce a whole lot of podcasts. I'm not very consistent with putting these out. And what you're noticing there is uh, that's true, and it's because I actually spend most of my time as far as creating educational content, I do that in video format. So I do a lot of videos on YouTube and on my own website, DIYGuitarMaking.com. That's the best way to find my videos is at DIYGuitarMaking.com. So if you want more of this content, uh, I think you're just going to have to migrate over to a different format, the video format, which is just a better format for me to teach in most of the time. I do like the podcasts because I can teach in a different format way which uh, we kind of just talked about so yeah if you want to find more of this check me out on youtube check me out at diyguitarmaking.com at diyguitarmaking.com you can subscribe to get the new episodes whether they're podcasts or videos in your inbox and i also realize that a lot of people are sort of migrating away from youtube and i get it i know why Uh, I think it's a good thing. There are many alternatives, and I'm starting to migrate myself onto some of those alternatives. So you can find me on Odyssey as well right now, and um, I'm working on it, but I'm not on there yet. I was thinking about adding Float to my repertoire of video platforms. So yes, I am definitely looking at more of those. And you know what? If any of you guys have a platform that you prefer that maybe I'm not aware of, please let me know. You can send me an email, or if you are watching this and listening to this on YouTube, you can just write it in the YouTube comments. I will take a look at it and possibly migrate over to there as well. All right, and now before we get into it, the last thing I want to say, since we're going to be talking specifically about tools, is that I am not affiliated with any tool companies. I don't do affiliate marketing or make money when you guys buy tools from other companies. The way I make money is when you guys buy things from me. So I just wanted to make that clear so there isn't a misunderstanding that I am promoting one tool or one tool over another because I'm not. I am agnostic when it comes to that sort of thing, which you can be when you have your own products and services. So uh, speaking of products and services, I actually have a bunch of radial rosette makers. This is a tool that I make and sell available right now. If you have been trying to get a radial rosette maker from me and have gotten the message that they're on back order, this happens frequently for me. Uh, It's hard for me to keep up with having enough of these made because I'm just a one-man shop. So I just wanted to let you know that I do have several of them available right now at the moment. So there's that. Okay, well, I think that's enough uh, run around there, and we are ready to get into this episode about clamps. Alright guys, so our first category of tools is going to be clamps. And that's because as a new woodworker, the category of clamps is often one of the first things that comes up. You know you need a lot of clamps and often you need a wide variety of clamps depending on the type of woodworking that you plan on doing. In this case, of course, we'll be doing acoustic guitar making. So I'm going to talk about the types of clamps that luthiers use. So just to go down the list real quick, we've got cam clamps, C-clamps, Ibex bridge clamps, spring clamps, specialty kerfing clamps, 
and quick grip bar clamps. Okay, so starting from the top, you're definitely going to want to get some wooden cam clamps. I've heard these called luthier's clamps. I've even heard these called guitar maker's clamps, uh, if you want to get really specific. But really what they are, in every case, is just wooden cam clamps. And it's always surprised me that general woodworkers typically don't even know what these are. Which is incredible because they're such a useful clamp. And I would imagine they would be just as useful to a general woodworker in the right situation. So these clamps are fast to deploy, they're lightweight, they don't mar your workpiece's surface, and they are light duty as well, which that could be a, a pro or a con depending on what you're trying to do with the clamps. There are a lot of situations in guitar making where we don't need a whole lot of pressure, and that's why these light duty clamps are really a backbone to our clamp supply. Oh, and one more thing I want to say about these clamps is when you're cranking that cam down, what's really cool is you can actually feel how much pressure you're putting on the workpiece through that cam. So you get an intuitive sense of how much pressure you're applying to a glue joint, whereas with a more heavy duty clamp like a C clamp, um, you never really know how much pressure you're, you're putting down, or at least it's harder to tell. So it's hard to describe this in words, but there's a real intuitive feel to these clamps. Okay, so how many of these clamps do I have? I have uh, over 60. I, I think I have like 65 or close to 70 wooden cam clamps right now. It's insane. But I use those clamps in the hands-on workshops where I have two students building guitars at the same time. And I also just love having all these extra clamps for my own purposes when I'm building multiple instruments at the same time. Those clamps are such a backbone of my clamp supply that over the years I've just collected dozens of them. So almost 70 clamps at this point. But don't get overwhelmed by that insane number because you're going to need uh, a lot less than that. You really can get away with, I would say, 16 clamps at a minimum. So you can glue and clamp the bracing pattern on your top and your back and also so you can attach the top and the back plate to the rim set. That really is your limiting factor um, as far as how many clamps you're going to need. You're going to need at least enough clamps to glue the top and the back plate. So basically enough clamps to run around the perimeter of the outline of your guitar. And more is always better, but again, 16, I think, will get you there. So yeah, definitely get yourself a whole bunch of cam clamps. They typically come in two sizes. There's long ones and there's short ones. The short ones are typically four and a half inches and the long ones are typically eight and a half inches as far as the reach of the clamp goes. You're going to need some long ones to get into those far reaching waist areas when you're gluing the plates um, or just deep into closer to the center of your X when you're gluing your bracing pattern down. Now, of course, there's different ways to do these two steps. You can use a go bar deck system, but I don't want to go there. Just assuming that you, you want to use cam clamps for a lot of these simple procedures, and a lot of people will, so we're going to keep it simple and just assume that you're not using a go bar setup. Okay, let's move on to the next set of clamps here, and that's C-clamps. C-clamps are very common. Uh, if you've done no woodworking whatsoever, you'll probably recognize these clamps. Even if you've just walked through a Home Depot to grab a light bulb or something, you've probably seen one of these clamps. They're great heavy-duty clamps for getting a lot of pressure in cases where you actually need a lot of pressure. And the other problem that they solve, you could say, is they put their pressure directly straight down the axis of the, uh, of the threaded rod. So your workpiece, when you're gluing it, doesn't slide 
I think a better way of saying this is that the force vector is perpendicular to the glue joint or nearly perpendicular to the glue joint rather than skewing at an angle which slides your workpiece, especially when it's lubricated with glue. The cam clamps, alternatively, they pull to the side a little bit. So when you're gluing down the neck block or something like that, if you use a cam clamp, you'll be fighting the fact that that neck block wants to swim and pull towards the body of the clamp. The C-clamps don't pull towards the body of, of the clamp in the same way that a cam clamp does. So it's good to have both. So C-clamps come in a wide variety of sizes. I have C-clamps ranging from itty-bitty 1-inch C-clamps to big 12-inch C-clamps and everything in between. And I use them all, really. Uh, but when you're just starting out, the most useful range, I think, is that middle range. So like 6-inch, 4-inch, and 3-inch. I think if you just get a little variety of those and some deep reach C clamps. Those are gonna be necessary for certain things. Generally, what you're gonna be using these for is anywhere where you want to, as reliably as possible, hold something in position. There are certain other types of clamps that will hold something down for you know quick marking of lines and things like that, but they're not very reliable if you were to grab onto the piece and kind of shake it or shimmy it around or bump into it. C-clamps are super reliable. They put good solid pressure down. There's no, like I mentioned before, there's no pulling towards the body of the clamp or at least very little of it or anything like that. So very reliable and they are heavy duty. Um, I mean, there's much pressure as you want to give it by uh, turning the um, threaded portion but they can be very heavy duty, so if you need good solid clamping pressure. Some specific instances where I use C-clamps are assembling the neck blank. I use a lot of C-clamps for that, for attaching the blocks, that is the neck block and the tail block to the rim set, and a variety of other things as well, um, positioning the fretboard on the neck blank and holding it down reliably on its center. C-clamps are great for that. Moving on from the C-clamps, we've got Ibex bridge clamps. So these are just, they're basically C-clamps, but they're very wide reaching and they're, they're basically of an appropriate size to be able to fit through the sound hole and glue your bridge. So having two, three, maybe four at the most, but three Ibex bridge clamps, you should be able to do any kind of bridge glue up that you need to. And the reason these work so well for gluing bridges is because these clamps are very lightweight. The body of the clamp is made out of aluminum. So if it was made out of steel or some other heavy metal, um, like a lot of C-clamps are, then that would be way too much of a sort of levering action on the back end of the clamp, which would affect your bridge glue up. So they have to be lightweight because they reach so far. As an alternative to using these Ibex bridge clamps, Ibex, by the way, is a brand name. Um, it's not a description of the clamp, actually, but it's kind of like, you know, the same way how Super Glue is a brand name at this point. Um, as far as I can tell, they're really the only ones making these, these types of clamps. So everyone just calls them Ibex bridge clamps. But anyway, don't want to digress there. As an alternative to the Ibex bridge clamps, you can use Fox Style. That's Charles Fox, the guy who invented the side bending machine also came up with these cool uh, bridge clamps very simple idea it's basically a plate of steel or aluminum that you attach to your bridge using two bolts that get passed through two holes in the plate and then threaded through your e-string holes on your bridge 
all of that gets threaded then through two holes on your set on the soundboard that you've drilled prior to this in order to locate the bridge and then on the very ends of that plate are two more bolts that you use to put pressure on the ends of the wings it's the kind of thing where if you see it you understand how it works instantly so look this up and take a look at the fox style bridge clamp and maybe that's the way you want to go with gluing your bridges one big advantage to this is that you don't have a bunch of clamps cluttering up the sound hole and preventing you from cleaning up squeeze out around your bridge or from working on other parts of the guitar while the bridge clamp is in place that's the reason that why i actually switched to the fox style bridge clamp is because i wanted to be able to continue working on my fretwork while the bridge is curing and i can do that with the fox style bridge clamp Next up, spring clamps. So these are great to have around for a couple of different reasons. The main reason is just quick convenience. Like say when you're marking out a template design, like say your bridge shape or a headstock shape, and you have your template and you want to stick it down just well enough to be able to trace its outline onto a piece of wood. Spring clamps are great because they're just quick deploying and you can still manipulate the workpiece under pressure because the pressure is pretty light. So I can throw it on there if I'm not perfectly lined up on center without having to remove the clamps. I can leave the clamps on and just kind of wiggle or fudge it over onto its center and then trace out its shape. So that's primarily what I keep spring clamps around for. I also have a bunch of mini spring clamps which I use for the bending process in my side bending machine in order to hold the slats together that make up my bending sandwich. For most uses, I prefer the metal spring clamps. They cost a little bit more than those cheap plastic ones. Um, although those cheap plastic ones work okay too, they just tend to break down over time. The pads on the front will break off or the little nuts that hold the spring together will work loose and, and fall off uh, onto the floor and then just disappear somehow. So yeah, you, you'll end up, you know, I've thrown out a bunch of those plastic ones over the years and I have a bunch of metal ones too. And those I've never thrown out. I've never had to, they keep together. Okay, the next category of clamps is kerfing clamps. Now, kerfing clamps isn't any one type of clamp. If you look up kerfing clamps, you will see a variety of different things that people use to install the kerfing. So really, the definition of a kerfing clamp is anything you would use to install the kerfing. In fact, in the previous segment, I just talked about spring clamps and those little mini spring clamps, the really small ones, those work as kerfing clamps. A lot of people use those as kerfing clamps. I don't recommend them. I don't think they work great. They put the pressure from that clamp is like it's, it's pinching down in one place. So it's not really distributing the pressure nice and evenly across the full height of that kerfing. So for that reason, I prefer something different. But I do understand that for most people, especially if you're just getting started out, you just want to use something that works. It doesn't have to be the greatest thing or the most professional thing. So really the simplest thing and the thing that m most people use, and it's kind of the old school way of doing this too, is simply clothes pins with rubber bands wrapped around them. Those work pretty good as kerfing clamps. And it's what I've used for years and years. Um, I now do something a little bit different, and I've done a video on this before, so if you're really interested, you can look this up. I basically modify mini C-clamps to turn them into kerfing clamps. So if you're interested in that, just go to DIYGuitarMaking.com, and you can look up that video on kerfing clamps. 
but making those clamps is time consuming and it's a little expensive because you have to buy all these little mini C clamps and the what you're actually getting for it the payoff is so marginal that if you're a new builder you're not even going to notice it or care about it so I, I don't necessarily want to push new builders in that direction I really think the old um, staple of just using clothespins with rubber bands wrapped around them works well enough for most people so that's what I would actually recommend now if you look up kerfing clamps you will see one product that uh, didn't exist when I got started but now it's I, I see a lot of companies offer this these they make something called kerfing clamps and they are purpose designed for installing kerfing they're expensive and they work only a little bit better than the clothes pins wrapped in rubber bands I kinda AB tested those and really the difference was very slight between them with the purpose-built kerfing clamps being slightly better so I don't really think they're worth the exorbitant cost to get a full set of those kerfing clamps because again they're very expensive Lastly, let's talk about quick grip bar clamps. These are registered trademark, similar to how Ibex is the registered trademark of the bridge clamps. Similar thing here. Uh, I'm not sure if someone makes knockoffs of these. Someone probably does, but this is a Irwin product. And I'm mentioning these simply because they are very ubiquitous. Uh, I go to anyone's shop and I'm always I'm pretty much guaranteed to see some of these bar clamps if you watch YouTube videos a lot of people are using these quick grip bar clamps I actually don't use them at all I have a, a box of them that just gathers dust under a bench in my shop uh, it's not because I hate these clamps they're they work pretty good for for what they're intended for I just uh, I, I have so many cam clamps and they're such a better clamp for any situation where I would want a quick grip clamp that I simply just never have the impulse to reach for one of those Irwin quick grip clamps. But I do want to mention them here because it's a great way to, in some cases, save money on getting tons of more expensive clamps like the cam clamps. Because these quick grip clamps, that's so hard for me to say by the way, quick grip clamps. When you say it fast, it's really hard. <laughs> um, these quick grip bar clamps work just as well as the cam clamps in situations where they can actually reach the workpiece, which is rare because that's the, the biggest downside with these clamps is they're very shallow. They simply don't have the depth to do most of the jobs that a luthier would use cam clamps for. But if you keep a couple of them around, you will find that in certain cases where the depth isn't needed, this clamp will work just as well. And it has some other nice little benefits to it. It's, you can kind of just use one hand to trigger it because it has uh, basically a trigger mechanism on it that you squeeze to apply the pressure. And also when you're releasing the clamp, it has a nice quick release button. So they're convenient and easy to use in that way. Okay, I wasn't planning on doing this, but I'm going to make one more mention here. Consider it an honorable mention, and that is Go Bars and the Go Bar deck. Um, I realize as I'm talking about clamps here that Go Bars are not actually a clamp, but they're doing the same job as clamps. They distribute pressure across the workpiece during glue up, and they solve a very specific problem in luthery, which is. One, the cluttering of clamps that would exist if you just used clamps, say cam clamps, to glue your bracing pattern down, but also the fact that even with deep reach, long cam clamps, it is still very difficult to reach the very center of your bracing pattern, especially on a larger instrument. And the solution to that is to build a go-bar deck, 
which is essentially like a room without walls. You have a floor and a ceiling connected by posts. You place your workpiece on the floor and brace flexible, usually fiberglass, flexible fiberglass rods against what your, your, your workpiece and what you're gluing to it and the ceiling above. What I used to use as go bars was actually kite rod stock. Just like there are geeks out there like us that enjoy building guitars, there are geeks out there that enjoy building kites. And maybe you're both. So then you're in luck, because you probably have a bunch of go bars at the ready. Stu Mac sells their version of go bar rods, which actually I prefer. I really like theirs, just because it's a lot stiffer than the kite rod stock. So I'm never worried about getting poor pressure down on my glue joint. Now this technique is nothing new. This goes back centuries to classical guitar making. So they didn't have fiberglass rods then, and you still don't have to use fiberglass rods today if you don't want to. You can simply use a piece of hard wood, like say, I don't know, oak, a good hard stiff wood that's not going to be brittle and it's not going to break when you bend it a little bit. You can use that as your go bars, right? Just rip some thin, long strips on your table saw, and there you go. You now have go bars, and you just need to build a go bar deck. So that's a good, cheap way of building your own go bar rods. And using a go bar system can dramatically reduce the amount of clamps that you need to use, because you can use the go bar system to do all of your brace work, and you can even use the go bar system to clamp the top and the back plate to the rim set. So that saves you a lot of money on clamps that you would otherwise need. If you enjoyed this and you learned something here, please subscribe and leave a review on whatever platform that you are enjoying this on at the moment. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or you can register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania. Bye for now.